Well, thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, I may not, as it were, get to that because as I was preparing this talk, I realized I didn't understand the formulas quite as well as I hoped. So uh, I'm going to give a survey of, um, of the sort of perspective that uh, Kai Berend and I are developing for understanding uh, derived stacks, uh, and in particular, higher stacks. Um, and if I could uh, say as a point, so a lot of the territory I'll cover will be very similar to Dominic's territory, but it's sort of the opposite point of view. Uh, Dominic likes to take minimal uh, resolutions. I'm going to take rather large realizations of things in the hope that there's more room to move and to do construction. So uh, it's a, that's a bit abstract, so let me just try to explain what I'm talking about. So everything will be in the context of these things called categories of vibrant objects, which were uh, introduced long ago, as many of the techniques which we use in this subject were, in algebraic K theory. So they were introduced in by Ken Brown, and, and I'm a big fan of them now. So, before I give the axioms, let me say that an example of a category of vibrant objects is the vibrant object in a, a closed model category. So we know, but the point is there are much smaller examples. Closed model categories have lots of limits and co-limits, so they're sort of vast spaces in which to work. But in differential geometry, we work with manifolds. Manifolds don't have uh, co-products in particular. So, so uh, when you work with a category of vibrant objects, you're trying to strip down homotopy theory to its like absolute essence. So I'm going to have a, a category, which I'll call a category of spaces. That's my category of vibrant objects. And there are two subcategories. So first we have the subcategory of weak equivalences. So it's a subcategory. It contains all isomorphisms. And it satisfies this uh, two out of three axiom, uh, which is, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with, or if you prefer, left and right cancellation. So if um, if G is a weak equivalence and either F or G is a weak equivalence, then the other one is. So that's the weak equivalences. Then we have the vibrations. These are also a subcategory. And the key point about a, a category of vibrant objects is Unlike in a closed model category, we don't assume that morphisms all have pullbacks. But we do assume that vibrations have pullbacks. But just vibrations. And the pullback of a vibration is a vibration. Okay. And there are two more axioms. The first axiom is that there's a terminal object and I'll call that E. And so if you have any object, it has a unique morphism to the terminal object and that is a vibration. And the other axiom, well, let's go back to closed model categories. Every morphism factors into a trivial co-fibration followed by a fibration. Well, we don't know, what, we don't know anything about co-fibrations. But 
at least we could ask for factorizations into a weak equivalent followed by a fibration. That's the axiom. So let me draw a fibration as a double arrowhead and a weak equivalent like that. So we always have such a, a factorization. And actually then, Brown proves something which you can call Brown's lemma, which is that with these axioms we can actually strengthen this result and we can assume that this weak equivalent is actually a section of a... Um, oh, sorry, let me first say... Um, Morphisms, oops, I'm sorry, I left out here, um, in, in here, all isomorphisms are vibrations. Yeah. So, a morphism which is both a vibration and a weak equivalence is called a trivial vibration. Oh, sorry, and, and I left out an axiom pullbacks of trivial vibrations are trivial vibrations. Now I've got all the axioms on the board. Stepping set W is not a morphism? No. No, no, no. So in the case of fibrin, all the fibrant objects in the closed model category, it is the trivial vibration. So there are a lot of them. Um, yeah. And so, as I said, all of these axioms hold. And then Brown's lemma is, with all these axioms, you can strengthen factorization um, so we get a picture like this. Let's call this R. R is a section of a trivial vibration. So that turns out to be very useful technically. And I could say this lemma has been rediscover rediscovered repeatedly. In a sense, it goes back to Sarah. Maybe I should explain that... Sorry, does that mean that it's automatic from C to X? That's right. And that our... You see, it's automatic that if we have a weak equivalence, then any section of it is a weak equivalence by two out of three. And so this is then a strengthening. But certainly not every weak equivalence is a section of a trivial vibration. So to give an example, if we have uh, simplicial sets, And uh, vibrations will be Kahn vibrations. Weak equivalences will be weak equivalences. And then factorization, what we can do is take P to be the fibred quotient of, of X with the path space of Y. This is, this is fair, effectively. Fair introduces this in 1951 in the case of topological spaces and then Moore and Kahn extend this to simplicial sets and the idea now is to do derived algebraic geometry bearing this in mind. That's the, that's the point. Okay? So, um, so I should give some examples which are more relevant to uh, derived algebraic geometry. Um, so, I won't get to the real examples just yet. Let me wait a minute. But for now, let me say um, I can take nilpotent L infinity algebras would be an example, just to give a, an idea. And then weak equivalences are just quasi-isomorphisms of the underlying complexes. 
and vibrations are just surjective morphisms of L infinity algebra. So, uh, okay, maybe those of you who aren't so interested in this talk can spend the rest of the talk proving that's a category of vibrant object. It's an example, though. These, are, these can be thought of as vibrant uh, co-commutative co-algebras in the usual way. But they're not all vibrant co-commutative co-algebras. That's the point. Yeah? I don't think so. Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't... Yeah. I need some... I think I need... I, I, I actually... To have a path space. I don't know quite. Anyway. Okay. So, um, so now I'm going to define infinity groupoids or higher stacks. Okay. So to do this, I need some notion of a topology or of, I think in Tuan and Fetsosi, they use the terminology admissible morphisms. They, in fact, took this idea from the non-derived case where it was introduced by uh, Carlos Simpson. So here are, here's a, a set of axioms for what a topology on a category of vibrant objects is. Now, by topology here I mean something like a Grothendieck pre-topology. But, so that's a collection of covers but I'm going to simplify life. When we take covers in algebraic geometry, we take sets of morphisms, but I'm just going to assume my covers have a single morphism just to simplify things. So I have, in fact, a subcategory of my... So it's a subcategory of covers. So that's one of the axioms of Grothendieck pre-topologies is that a composition of covers is a cover. And my covers will lie between the fibr... All the covers will be vibrations and every trivial vibration will be a cover. So they lie in between. W... And now I have two, two axioms remaining. The main axiom for pre-topologies is that the pullback of a cover is a cover. And then an unexpected axiom, which seems to hold for almost all Grothendieck pre-topologies of interest and which seems essential for the development of the subject um, but is not usually part of the definition of topology so I apologize for calling these topologies but on the other hand I don't think it does any harm. So if G, F and F are covers then so is G. So that is true for so to give an example, uh, subjective submersions between manifolds, I should say every, well, maybe I should, not manifolds, let me try again. So um, let's take V to be schemes, F, all morphisms, and W isomorphisms. So this is a, a rather trivial example of a category of vibrant objects. Here I'm using that every morphism can be pulled back for schemes. So I've avoided the main reason for which I introduced categories of vibrant objects, which is that typically not all morphisms have pullbacks. But, and then I take C, the covers, to be subjective submersions. That's 
an example. So if I work in this context, I'm going to get uh, higher Artin stacks. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I apologize. I usually work in the analytic category, so I'm not really good at uh, the algebraic geometric language. But the point is that this class of covers does satisfy this axiom. And if you open the stack book, you know, that's the, the I don't know, thousands of pages Columbia tome, and there's a chapter which pretty much just one after the other shows that this axiom holds for typical collections of um, pre-topologies. <coughs> okay? I'm sorry? When you say this is class stack, you have in mind that when you drop this lot of, you're going to give it, you're going to give it I'm now going to define space. what a category of fiber, I'm going to define a category of fibrant objects now, which will be the higher stack, starting with this data. Right. So, I'm going to introduce now a category of infinity groupoids. It will be a subcategory a full subcategory of the category of simplicial objects in V. So, in V, and now I take a full subcategory of infinity groupoids, and I uh, here am, in some sense, inspired by Duskin and Resk, and then in between we have the whole development of the theory of derived stacks, and then this exact definition can be found in one specific case, in Pridham. So the idea in Duskin was to introduce the analogue of the Kahn condition to define higher groupoids. So, actually, the whole point of Duskin was to define n groupoids. In particular, Kahn complexes are infinity groupoids. The idea in RESC is to introduce an auxiliary condition called redefibrancy, which arose in uh, homotopical algebra in the work of Bousfield and Kahn. And Basically, this is what I mean when I say that I'm taking very big realizations of derived stacks. Eventually, derived stacks will be an example of this. And so the, the realizations are going to be fatter than the first examples one might write down. So let me, let me define what an infinity groupoid is. So it's a simplicial object. So I have the... For each n greater than or equal to uh, zero, I have an object in V, xn, and then there's all the completion map space and degeneracy maps between these objects. And since I'm calling objects in V spaces, this is a simplicial space. And so now the, the main condition is the following. And this imitates the Kahn condition. So if you've seen the Kahn condition, this should look a bit familiar. If you haven't seen the Kahn condition, I'll give a couple of examples. So we have a simplicial subset of the simplicial n simplex. So this is the union of the faces of, so the, an, the n simplex has n plus 1 faces numbered from 0 to n and we uh, take the union of all but the i space and that gives us a, an n minus 1 dimensional simplicial complex. <coughs> and so then, and I'll justify this in a moment, we can take, maybe, all the maps 
from this simplicial set to this simplicial object. Now, unfortunately, this is some finite limit. It may not exist. So, later, I'll, I'll give you a, an additional axiom which will guarantee it exists. And I have, then, a map from Xn, the nth space, to this object. Why? Because the, this is called the horn, is the subcomplex of delta n, so then just I'm restricting to the horn. All right? And this should be a cover for n greater than 0 and i lying between 0 and n. So that's, that this axiom won't make sense except if I impose the other axiom. Well, the other condition. And the other condition is called Reedy vibrancy. And in the context of infinity categories, this was introduced into the subject by Resk in around 98. And it looks innocent. He says it's innocent. And it is innocent, except that it's in practice quite hard to ensure it holds. So it's hard if I impose this condition, to actually have any examples at all. So from this perspective, the trick in the subject is to uh, find Reedy fibrant resolution. So the condition is the following, that Xn to maps from the boundary of the n simplex to X is a vibration for all n greater than or equal to zero. So now I should say a couple of things. The first is that if this condition holds up to n minus 1, then this space is defined and these spaces are defined. And therefore, we can ask for the next axiom. So this, uh, this is uh, pretty much established in papers of uh, Dagger, Hollander, Isaacson, and uh, on request. So, um, so they laid out this strategy. In fact, it's already visible in SGA4 in Verdier's uh, article on hypercovers, I mean his seminar. So, um, so that's the strategy that because this is assumed, this makes sense. We have these particular finite limits. Okay? The Siegel condition, yeah, well, that would be a second talk. The Siegel condition is exact, uh, assuming this hypo let's assume this, then this is exactly the point of Resk's paper. The Siegel condition is, except is the inner horn condition. So I can get away with it. That defines what he calls Siegel spaces. And then his paper is about complete Siegel spaces. There's an additional axiom which one should impose. It turns out that it's not, to define the infinity categories, it's not quite sufficient to just have this axiom for, for inner horns, but you want an additional axiom involving quasi-isomorphism. So I'll come to that, actually, as it happens. But, uh, but so the answer is yes and no. Okay? But it's not the point. It can try, I mean, I'm, that would be an in completely different story. No, no, I mean, mm. you can try to define the group or that the That's what this is. I mean, what's the difference? What's the difference? I mean, that's exactly what I just did. What else would there be? Well, okay, the Siegel condition plus on top of invertibility for. That's but this is contained here. That's Kahn implies Siegel. All right. That's what I'm saying. Siegel is just this condition ex with with zero the case of zero and n excluded. Okay, okay, that's the point. This implies the Siegel condition. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the insights here that the Siegel condition, which is usually expressed in terms of uh, iterated fiber products of one simplices actually can instead be, be reformulated in a more calm, traditional way. Yeah, but you don't give maps then. Huh? Seemingly, you don't give maps then. Yes, yeah. you do. You do? But yeah. Uh, but you still will need the Siegel condition. The Siegel condition... Okay, anyway. Um, the point is that the, the Siegel condition will only be 
this condition in the presence of Reedy vibrancy, in which case you can give this condition. Okay? So, um, where was I? Right, I have to define vibrations and weak equivalences. All right? So, vibrations. So, these are defined a lot like these objects. Uh, the condition is we have a, a, a map F from X to Y. When is it a vibration? Uh, the condition is that the map from Xn to the fibered product of horns in X over fib uh, fibered over horns in Y with Yn for n greater than zero and that these are covers and again a Reedy vibrancy condition like this. Um, plus Reedy vibrancy, which says that Xn to maps from boundary of X crossed with maps from the boundary, sorry, boundary of the n simplex to X, uh, uh, right, Yn is a vibration. N greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So those are the five. Yes? Can you put the conditions now on the collection of covered towns in the category of vibrations? I fixed the category of vibrations. I fixed the topology on the category of vibrations. Now I'm constructing a new category of vibrations. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And where was I? Uh, I? I'm going to, in a moment, define weak equivalences, but before I do that, I realized I wanted to give some examples in low N of what these conditions were, because otherwise it's a bit, it's all a bit abstract. So for that condition, what we're saying, for example, is that the two face maps from X1 to X0 are covers. And this, of course, so if we think of X0 as being like the objects of a Lie groupoid, and X1 as being like the morphisms of a Lie groupoid, this is the condition that the source and target maps are covers, uh, smooth maps. That's the condition which was introduced by Erismann in 1958 as the definition of a Lie groupoid. So we're going right back to uh, Erismann. And, and, this and so the whole point of um, this condition is to find the right set of extensions of Erismann's original condition to higher n. Uh, as for this condition, this is not in Erismann, and this is somehow the innovation which makes everything kind of flow. And it says, for example, that the product of source and target for x1 to x0 cross x0 is a vibration. Now, if we're in the scheme world where all morphisms were vibrations, this, doesn't, this is no extra condition. In the manifold world, there won't be any Lie groupoids in practice or no interesting ones which satisfy this condition. So this Reedy vibrancy leaves Lie groupoids out, but it does handle some sort of uh, analytic uh, space or um, you could work, for example, with Lie groupoids in, in loci, which are the... Um, completion of uh, manifolds uh, and various other settings in if you wanted to work with Lie groupoids in this setup. But uh, we'll certainly be able to work with derived stacks in, in this framework, as I'll come back to. Okay? Are there any questions about this, this bit? This is the key. Well, the, the only solution I would have would be to take all morphisms as vibrations. Unfortunately, not all morphisms have pullbacks. But if I go to loci, then they do. That is the opposite category of C infinity rings. Yeah. So, I'm sorry? Uh, well, they're called loci. <laughs> what? Well, that's because they were in, I mean, the book I read about them in called them loci. Yeah. 
uh, Mordaik and his collaborator, I forgot their name. Yeah. Since yeah. you mentioned examples, uh, yeah. in the categories of fiber objects, what you can take as examples, like places and the opposite of places, like houses. No, no, the opposite of an o a category of vibrant objects is not a category oh, of vibrant right. objects. But if you take conditional algebra, yes. don't you treat that a category of vibrant objects? Because there is a model structure on that. That's my point. That First of all, that will, yeah, so <laughs> my point is I don't want to take all objects, all algebras, all spaces. I want to take ones that we're interested in geometrically. See, the point of categories of vibrant objects is, that, well, in, not in Quillen's original definition, but in more modern treatments, we assume the existence of all limits and all co-limits. That's, in other words, we have... I mean, then we, you know, it becomes a discussion of, we in particular need axiom of choice, the real axiom of choice we need. We have to d get into discussions of the continuum hypothesis. I mean, the point is, I want to see how to understand derived differential geometry without using transfinite limits and co-limits. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to make the Yeah. But yeah. So, the answer is, uh, there are some examples, as you say, but the but I'm interested in precisely situations where they, those would not be examples, okay? Ah. I'm sorry? V is some, is a category of vibrant objects with a topology. And now I'm looking at a, I'm defining a new category of vibrant objects. Oh, delta is a simplicial set. So this is an abbreviation for a certain explicit finite limit. It's some explicit di finite diagram, if you like, in, in V. I mean, this, what, what it's saying, I mean, you can... So let's look at the, the special case uh, N equals 2, I equals 1. All right. So... <laughs> The picture looks like this. It's the tautological example. So this is some fibred product of x1 over x0 with x1. It may not exist, but if the map from x1 to x0 is a fibration, it will exist. All right? And so on. So, um, so that, this is an abbreviation, but I'm trying to write it in a more conceptual way. But one can unravel what it is as an explicit limit of an explicit finite diagram. Okay. I'm sorry, can you shout? And weak equivalences, right? So, so the weak equivalences, it's very hard to say what a weak equivalence of simplicial sets is or simplicial spaces. But if you presume, in addition, fibrancy, then there's a simple closed uh, sort of diagnostic for when a map is a weak equivalence. So I'll just write that down. So, the weak equivalences so they should first of all be really fibrant. So, I I had really fibrancy here. And no, actually, I'm sorry. I don't need really fibrancy. Let me scratch that. Here's the axiom. We take the fibred product of xn with yn plus 1, and here the map from yn plus 1 to yn is the, the last face map. Right. And this map is just f. And that map to, well, we can take, maybe I should have mentioned the maps from the boundary, the nth simplex to x, is also known as the nth matching space. So if you 
you know, if you've read textbooks on closed model categories, you may have seen this notation. And So we take horns in Y of dimension N plus 1, and let me draw a picture. So, so this is the case N equals 2. I have here, the idea is I have a horn taking values in Y, and I lift the, this, the boundary of the last phase, which is here, to X. So that's, this space parameterizes all such choices, and then on the other hand, I can consider the three simplices in Y with a lift on that last phase to X. And this map should be a cover for all. Now, if we take the special case of sets, so we look at simplicial sets, this statement is exactly the statement that the relative homotopy groups vanish. So that's a possible definition for a weak equivalence between Kahn-fibrant uh, 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 simplicial sets. So this is, it turns out, a lift of that condition to our world. And then the theorem is that uh, S so, theorem, which is a bit more complicated than I expected to prove. Maybe there's a simpler proof, but I suspect not. This is a category of fibrant objects. Okay. So, so that's and so, the I, so the, here's the proposal that derived stacks should just fit into this language. So looking in the uh, work of Toen Vetsossi, oh dear, I've forgotten the terminology they use, but they use the idea of having an enveloping closed model category and looking at some subcategory of that. Uh, thank you. And I'm throwing away the superstructure and just trying to work internally. That's the the strategy here. So, so, you know, I guess that this is a, a philosophical difference between, you know, uh, thinking geometric, uh, if you like, thinking like in coordinates, which is something I'm, I can only, only, the only thing I can do, or instead working with simplicial sheaves. And I'm a bit hesitant to, to throw this into some super structure, category of simplicial sheaves to study this. But, um, so anyway, so you can just prove this essentially by standard simplicial techniques. You just have to be careful to use the proofs in such a way that you only ever invoke axioms that you already had written down. So can you always complete your category of five objects to the In general, um, I'm not 100% sure. Szynski has written a lot about that general question. So I haven't checked exactly, but I can certainly show you the reference. Uh, he's interested in this partially because the opposite of a cat if you take pointed categories of fibrant objects, they are essentially the same thing. Well, they're the opposites of Waldhausen categories. So they're the natural setting to define algebraic K theory. So uh, this is the non-pointed case, and he's very much interested in exactly this question of embedding into a closed model category. So he, again, uses ideas of risk and he gets a long way, but I am hesitant. Do you remember Jesse? Does he quite pull it off? I, I, I think it's a bit, yeah. It, it, almost, I'm not sure if it's complete, but, but it's certainly stimulating to look at his, his work. So obviously, I mean, the standard point of view is that you have a presentable category and then you can represent all your um, objects as, as uh, pre-sheaves on um, 
on some, what are they called, uh, omega, uh, no, Aleph presentable objects. And then you replace those by simplicial sheaves and Daga shows how to realize the original closed model category as a, as a vouch field localization. So maybe some strategy along those lines might work in some cases of interest here too. But I haven't really thought about it. I'm sort of allergic to closed model categories at the moment in the sense that I'm trying to only use co-limits that seem geometric to me. And there aren't many, you don't use many co-limits in geometry somehow. Or in fact, almost the whole point, I thought, of derived geometry is to avoid ever mentioning co-limits. So I'm almost, oh geez. So, okay, that's the first page of my notes. Um, so I should say that once you have Reedy fibrancy, um, you get that if K is a finite simplicial complex and X is a infinity groupoid, then um, we can form an infinity groupoid of maps from K to X just by the end synthesis of this is just maps from K cross delta N to X. And it turns out that makes sense and is again an infinity groupoid. And you, um, so in particular you can form loop spaces and so on. And that's using Reedy fibrancy. All right? And another um, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, right, so I, so I want to give uh, some examples. How do you get Reedy fibrancy in practice? It's uh, the whole point now. So let me just for simplicity, let me assume I have a finite dimensional differential graded algebra. Kai and I are interested, in fact, in differential graded Banach algebras, and much of this works. But just for expository simplicity. So I want to construct some sort of uh, derived, uh, derived stack of the invertible elements in A. Okay, and I actually think this may, at this point, may relate in some way to Kai's talk on Friday, and it also very much relates to the work of Chokhan Fontanin and Kapranov on derived quat. So I'm not going to directly relate the construction I'm about to give you to that, but I want to show you some sort of technical trick which guarantees that I get really fibrancy. So your first guess might be to take as n simplices, so let me introduce a blackboard bold more carton of an algebra. It's going to be a curved uh, L infinity algebra. So it'll, uh, so what I do is I take a1, A2, A3, and so on. And I take, actually it's a differential graded algebra, it's not even, and, but, oh sorry, so what do I do now? Uh, I take A2 um, shifted down in dimension by one. Uh, let me write it like this. So, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> this is getting confusing. I want to take the uh, stupid truncation in degrees two and higher of A 
and shift it down in degree by one. So that's now in degrees one and higher. And it has a differential and a, a bracket. And I have A1 parameterizes uh, a curved, a family of curved L infinity structures on, on this thing. That's the, that's the axis, that's the outcome. So I want to think of this as a derived, um, derived Morat Carton, and this is what I mean by, this is the category in which this derived Morat Carton exists. A is a differential graded algebra. No, no, not commutative, no. Algebra. Well, algebra, yeah, associative algebra. No. Any degrees? Any degrees. I mean, sorry, sorry. So think the example to bear in mind is, um, so this is infinite dimensional, but take, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Dolbo resolution, or any resolution, of end E, where E is a graded holomorphic vector bundle. Something like that. Or a complex of holomorphic vector bundles. That's the example that I have in the back of my mind. But I'm one abstracting it to try to come to the essence of the matter. I have a, a differential graded algebra. Okay? No, forget commutativity, it's not the point. So this is the construction, and the point is, if I have a curved L infinity algebra, I can ask, when is its curvature zero? That gives me a locus in A1, which is the usual Morakatan locus. So that's, that was referred to as T0 in the previous talk. So T0 of this guy is the usual Morakatan locus. So it's the solutions of d omega plus omega squared is zero, where omega is in A1. Okay? So now, let me return to the question of defining the nerve. Your first guess is that to define the nerve, we take the moray carton locus for the tensor product of cochains, and here I technically I mean uh, normalized cochain. So this is a finite dimensional differential graded algebra tensored with A. Okay? So for n equals zero, you get just the Morag Carton locus of A. Those are the objects of this thing. For n equals one, well, it turns out you get just uh, intertwiners between things. So you get, I could say, a, a Siegel category here. You don't get a Actually, you get a complete Siegel category, but I haven't introduced those. So, um, but that's not the answer. The answer, and this is the main point of my talk, is that I really want to take a replacement for the n simplex here. Okay? So, So what's this blackboard bold delta? So let's remember that delta n is actually the nerve of the category with object 0 to n and morphisms up, moving up. And this guy is the nerve of, you could say, the localization of that category. So it has morphisms up and down. So it's a, it's a groupoid, which this category naturally sits inside. So the key idea here is, if I'm trying to do stack theory, I have to be able to move forward and backwards. And this is one way to arrange that, to replace the n simplex by this bigger thing, which is practically the same in the sense it is now an infinite dimensional completion complex, but it's still contractible, and we still have a lot of cofibrancy relations between these for different ends. Okay? 
So the case n equals 1 is very familiar. It may even have come up in the first week in uh, Joyal denotes it J. So it's the groupoid interval. And these guys, and this is sort of the main point of the talk, these guys are higher analogs, analogs for higher dimensional simplices of Joyal's groupoid interval. All right? And now I just take this construction. And the theorem is that this, with appropriate, I, so I haven't defined what the, the category of vibrant objects that this is sitting in is. So I guess I should. So I have here parameterized families of curved L infinity algebras. So the, the vibrations are going to be actually just affine maps of these guys, which are surjective. It's a very strong condition, but it, it works out. So there are very few vibrations in my differential, uh, deri in my derived stack world. The covers require, in addition, that the, you can define tangent complexes that, well, this here is the tangent complex. The, we, we go to a point in the classical locus and we get a complex, and so we look at the cohomology, and the condition is that that should be uh, an uh, isomorphism. That's the condition for covers. Oh, and sorry, and the, the classical loci is a cover, uh, let's say, subjective submersion. And the, ca and the condition for trivial vibration is that, that we have an isomorphism of tangent complex, and finally, an isomorphism of classical loci. So then the theorem is that this is a uh, infinity groupoid. So in particular, let me show you one tiny portion of that, namely that, going back to Erethman, that the source and target maps from N1 to N0, let me just say the source map, from N1 to N0, from the morphisms to the objects, this should be a, a cover. Incidentally, this is precisely the condition in Siegel spaces that makes them, make them complete Siegel spaces. This is the hard part. And so that's, that's what I want to emphasize. Everything else in this theorem is soft. This is the only place that you have to do, that you have to think to check this bit. And once you've checked this, everything else is a sort of universal formal consequence. All right? Uh, I started late. I have three minutes. Okay. Five, thank you. Okay. So, hmm. So I have two topics to cover in the next negative five minutes. The t original topic of the lecture I'll say something about that at the very end, but not enough. And one, I want to mention one thing which I, I like a lot. You can, imagine, you can ask yourself, what about the image of this guy in here? So now combining ideas of Resk, Schweil, and Tierney, in the case of sets, we, we see that the image is Joyal's notion of the uh, nerve, and this is somehow a resk type notion of the nerve. And the, the fact is that you get a trivial vibration from one to the other. So I just wanted to very briefly give some axioms for when that general fact holds. And it holds in this case of derived schemes. No, no, let me not do this. I'm sorry. I like it, but I, it's not the main point. The main point is the other way to ensure Reedy vibrancy. So our complex manifolds as derived stacks. That's a lot harder. <laughs> so, if you think about it, a complex manifold is usually realized as some charts, let's say pseudo-convex charts, 
glued together so you have some sort of groupoid, the check nerve of the atlas. But it's not reedy fibrant. So the task is to produce a reedy fibrant um, resolution. And even for a chart, it's not so straightforward to get a reedy fibrant. So, so let me take U in CN a pseudo-convex. Or if you want to work in the real world, you could take just a convex set. How do I make this little guy into a, a derived stack? So I have to find a simplicial object which is really vibrant. What's your initial uh, So in this case, it'll be, I'll have analytic families of L infinity. Okay? So it's the very natural analytic replacement for algebraic. So I need to find a simplicial object, let me call it Pn of u, which for example satisfies that P, let's say that P0 of u will be u. P1 of u mapping to u cross u should be a fibration. And I don't have many fibrations. So it's going to be a little tricky to arrange this. So let me finish. I, I guess I didn't say anything about the Chernvay. Uh, I'll, if somebody wants to ask a question, I'll say a couple of words. <laughs> so the finding an explicit resolution, which is a derived stack now, representing this pseudo-convex, is is a, a matter of imitating some work I did uh, on uh, infinity groupoids a few years ago. It's using the so-called, uh, uh, so I use something called the DuPont gauge. And essentially, if you have an L infinity algebra, then it's tensor product with cochains on delta N so L, L is a nilpotent L infinity algebra. And then this is again a uh, L infinity algebra. And again nilpotent. And you can and so the key point I want to say now is you extend this to the curved case by essentially the same formulas, and also you need parameterized versions but using convexity you can extend this. So the explicit and very complicated formulas, for n equals 1 you get Bernoulli numbers coming in, uh, you actually reproduce a construction of Fiorenza and Manetti, and, and so this is how you, you whack your open set, or some very small collection of them, into the world of derived stacks, and now you glue again using the fact that you have a category of fibrant objects to, to put, put things together. It's kind of complicated, but the message I want to convey is once you've done it once, you never have to do it again. So it kind of changes the notion of which presentations of manifolds we work with, but it's, uh, it's, it's very explicit. So that I, I wanted to say. Okay, uh, in one minute... The, so what I want to finally suggest is, so for example, let's look at the special case of the algebra of n by n matrices. So now, of course, my stack should be GLN but I gave you a very peculiar derived stack resolution of GLN, right? For GLN, I don't need to go through this procedure. I already gave you a Reedy fibrant replacement for GLN. So I get that, that uh, M, MCN of uh, N by N matrices with values in the cochains on the, this thickened n-simplex. 
so essentially what I'm saying is, uh, so for, to, to do Chern Bay, what I'm proposing is to focus on this guy and uh, for all n, think of this as a certain simplicial differential graded algebra and focus on its uh, non-commutative forms. So that's the, uh, and then find an explicit formula. So the, the symplectic form that was talked about in the last talk is essentially the second churn class. There's a lot of interest in the first churn class too. So this is the symplectic form. The first churn class is the determinant for perfect complexes, which is a somewhat complicated subject in itself. I'd better stop there.